Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Miller, if you want to call me Pastor. Uh, uh, a lot of folks here at the church do. However, I'm not on the pastoral staff here at the church. But uh, I'm Charles, and uh, it's good to have you folks tuning in tonight. Uh, once again, I said it's probably not hard for you to figure out. There isn't anybody I'm really preaching to here. So, uh, but uh, that that happens, and uh, you know, hey, uh, I only know what the results of what I minister and what I preach. Uh, maybe until I go to heaven uh, to find out just what kind of impact these messages have. Uh, but uh, we're going to be speaking again tonight, continuing out of First uh, Corinthians chapter fourteen. Uh, there with Paul's correction to the current uh, church at Corinth and uh, uh, what he, I would say, considered somewhat an abuse uh, or an error in the way that they presented and, and brought things forth as far as the gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit uh, initially, he starts off with the address of speaking in tongues, and uh, in that, uh, if you go back, well, I guess three three messages ago, you'll find out that, uh, you know, I did uh, bring a message using Scripture that clearly uh, puts it out there that, you know, uh, this Baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, glossolalia, is a biblical thing, and it is not just uh, maintained and kept uh, for the first century church. And when all the apostles died, it, 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 there was no more need for it, and it, it fizzled out. But uh, I use scripture, and then I also reference the fact that church history verifies the fact that this thing with glossolalia, speaking in tongues, has been recorded in church history that it continued past the first century church, even up to the current day that we're presently living in. So, but... Uh, uh, then last week, we went ahead to Paul's correction uh, to the church at Corinth and where there were some uh, 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 abuses maybe due to ignorance and immaturity uh, in, 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 in the spiritual aspect of their, their, their spiritual maturity uh, concerning uh tongues and interpretation and the manifestations or gifts of, of the Holy Spirit in the church. So we're going to go ahead and we're going back up just to uh, verse 14. I think we ended about verse 19, and we're going to continue through to the end of the chapter tonight. So get if you uh, use your Bible or you want to get your phone open to that portion of uh, you have a Bible app and want to open your uh, Bible app phone to, to that portion of Scripture, you'd be doing well. But let us open in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice, we give you praise, we give you thanks, Lord God, for your word. For Lord God, we, Lord God, know that, Lord God, we are encouraged in the things that you share with us through Scripture. Lord God, there are times we receive correction through the the uh, writings of your word, and that, Lord God, sometimes uh, we're even open to rebuke uh, through the, the writings of your scripture. It, it's profitable for different things uh, in, in the lives of the born-again, God-loving uh, uh, Christians, as we walk out our life. And you know, we don't ever arrive perfectly uh, even at, 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 at the time of our death. Uh, I, I, I don't want to put on the pretense that I'm, I'm going to be perfect. 
My standing with God is found in Jesus Christ, God's holy Son and only begotten one, in what he accomplished for humanity in his sacrificial death on the cross, his burial, and then his resurrection and ascension into heaven. But it's in Christ. In Christ is my boast. Not anything boasting of myself. But it's in Christ. As I position myself to be in Christ, and I position, uh, recognize his position of being in me through the uh, ministry of God's Holy Spirit. That's the only way that I can live in the life of righteousness and holiness that we are called to do as children of God as heirs of salvation. It's in Christ and Him alone. Amen. I uh, want to thank again, Senior Pastor, for uh, uh, opening the pulpit here. And I want to thank the sound and video man for, for his faithfulness. And uh, we're going to get right on into the message now. We're going to pick up, uh, backing up about five verses uh, till where we ended from last week, uh, the 14th verse of the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Amen. <clears throat> for Paul says, for if I pray in a tongue, that's in an unknown tongue, unknown to him, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. You know, a lot of times when I, in my prayer life, go off and I start praying in, in, in tongues, I will ask God to bring me the knowledge of that which the Spirit just prayed through me. And you can't pray a more perfect prayer than that which, which the Spirit is praying through you. Amen. And... Um, he goes on in verse 15 and says, What is the outcome then? I shall pray with the Spirit, and I shall pray with my mind or my understanding also. I shall sing with the Spirit, and I shall sing with my mind or with my natural language that I speak. Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit only, how will one who fills the place of the ungifted or the unlearned say the amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying? <laughs> this, is why, this is why... You know, uh, in our services, we, we, we have a time of prayer corporately. You don't have everybody praying in tongues. Because if you've had somebody come in off the street that's never been in your church before, maybe they're not even saved. Well, maybe they're of another uh, 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 denominational background where they, 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 they have not been instructed. In the knowledge of praying in tongues. I've never been in a church where everybody's praying and uh, what are singing in the Spirit. However, obviously, maybe in the first century church, maybe they did. But, you know, hey, if that happens, I would only uh, begin to be believe that 
uh, it would have to be the Spirit because they would all have to be speaking the same tongue. Otherwise, you'd have complete chaos going on there. How in the world can people sing together corporately in tongues unless it would be of the Spirit of God where they're all singing from the same tongue? Maybe all known to any of them, but yet it's the Spirit. I've never experienced that, and I've, I, I was raised in a Pentecostal church, and uh, I've been walking with the Lord for, uh, uh, I'm working towards my 50th year of walking faithfully with the Lord. Amen. Faithfully, I'm, I'm just saying I did have a period of time where, where I just went out and, 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 and I went the ways of the world. But for 50 years now, I've been uh, steadfastly as far as being consistent in pursuing the life that I have in Jesus Christ, living out and working out that salvation that I have received. God's salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 17. For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. When you're praising and worshiping God in tongues, you know those around you, they aren't being edified. You know, I can't say I don't do that in church, but I do it to myself. I do it very quietly where somebody would have to have their ear up here, you know, to, to even hear me. All right. But you don't do it out loud uh, where everybody can hear you because it's not edifying them. But Paul goes on here in verse 18, addressing this business of speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Paul received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, some uh, will say, well, we don't have any record of when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, we know he laid hands on the Ephesians. The believers, uh, I believe there was about 12 of them, 12 men in all. He laid hands on them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now here in, in, in a letter written to the church at Corinth, he's telling them, listen, I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. You get what Paul's saying there? Do you understand what he's saying there? He said, I'd rather speak five words in the language of the people that I'm speaking to, and sometimes that has to be with a translator because you don't know their language, or if you're speaking to people that speak the same language as you do, five words in that known tongue, then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. That says a lot. That says a lot. That really says a lot. Now, verse 20, and we'll be reading on through verse 40 and speaking periodically on things. In fact, I'm even going to reference another book here 
in the Bible and the uh, New Testament here in a little while as we continue. But starting at verse 20 now, fresh for tonight. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil be babes, but in your thinking be mature. Otherwise, in the thought process of your ministry in the church, be mature. Allow your giftings to bring you to a place of maturity where you have an understanding of that gift. And know how to properly use that church, that, that gift when you're in the church. The assembly of, of, of fellow believers in the congregation that you're at. But as far as evil, be babes. Listen, don't try to mature in evil. Mature in your knowledge against evil, but not in the practice of evil. Verse 21, In the law it is written, By men of strange tongues, and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So Paul, what I mean, God addressing the Old Covenant people of Israel, he left them know that, hey, listen, there's come, going to come a time where I will have people of a strange tongue who are strangers to you speak. And yet you won't listen to what God is saying through them. Is that not what happened with the uh, predominant nation of Israel, the Israelites, under the new covenant? Predominantly even to this day, Jews reject anything. that Gentiles who have come to the save the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior because they reject Jesus Christ as being their Messiah. The Lord would really have to be working on the heart of a, a, a most Jewish people for them to enter into a Gentile Christian church. To hear preaching and teaching of the Word. Because still as a people, they have predominantly rejected Jesus Christ as their promised Messiah, the Christ that was promised to them. Excuse me while I take a sip of water here. Continuing with verse 22. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to all believers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to all believers, but to those who believe. Now I want to 
share with you. Uh, maybe next week, maybe we'll go to Romans chapter 12, where uh, the, the, the 12 manifestations or gifts of the Holy Spirit are addressed uh, in some detail. But um, listen, just take the day of Pentecost. The tongues of fire descended upon them. And there was a great sound of a mighty rushing wind that swept through the, the place where they were. And uh, they all began to speak in tongues with glossolalia that they had not been taught or learned. Listen, there was 3,000 people added to the church. People were all, who were all believers. Some of them were even scoffers. If you go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 14 or 13, uh, it, it talks there. Some of them said, hey, some of, the, some of the people that came rallying around to find out what was going on after after standing there for a, a, a little bit of time, said, hey, these people were full of, 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 of sweet or new wine. They were accusing them of being drunk. 3,000 souls of all those that gathered around to find out what was going on got saved. Amen. After Peter's uh, getting up and addressing the issue and speaking to them about what it was that they were observing, going back to the prophet Joel. Until he got done preaching and stuff, these people wanted to know what they needed to do to be saved, and there was 3,000 souls added to the believers that day. Amen. From unbelieving to believing. Amen. Verse 23 says, If therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues, and all gifted or all learned men pertaining speaking in tongues, or on believers enter into the church while you're all speaking in tongues. Will they not say that you are mad? Now, just referring back to Acts chapter 2, I believe it's verse 13, however, it could be verse 14, but I think it's 13, uh, if my memory serves me right. Uh, those scoffers thinking that they were drunk. Well, doesn't a, a, a drunk individual get a little bit irrational uh, in their behavior? You know, hey, they they aren't quite thinking as clearly as they might at other times. Their behavior is showing signs that uh, they're uh, somewhat inhibited by their alcohol consumption, impaired a little bit. Well, here that's what that's what. People who are all learned, even though they may be Christians, concerning uh, speaking in tongues, uh, or an unsaved people come into the church while you're all acting, uh, praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, that's what they're going to think. Hey, these people ain't, 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 ain't functioning on, on, on all eight cylinders.
you know, hey, the elevator ain't reaching the top. So Paul's giving correction. Apparently, these are the kind of things that he was hearing was going on in the church services at the church in Corinth. And he goes on in verse 24, and he addresses prophecy. But if all prophesy, and an all believer or an all gifted man enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are being disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Amen. You know, even sometimes when you preach, people say, hey, that preacher man's reading my mail. But then yet for somebody to prophesy, get up and, and, and actually point you out and start telling you things about your life that you know this guy that doesn't know you, or maybe you just vaguely know one another, has no way of knowing what he is saying. He'll be convinced it's God working and ministering through you. And he'll, he'll be convicted. Amen. He'll fall on his face and worship God and declaring that God is certainly amongst you. Amen. Among you. Verse 26. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble together, when you assemble, each one has a psalm has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, and has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. That's one way to uh, discern when somebody gets up and gives a word of, 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 of prophecy in a church service, whether it's of God. Why? Because it's going to edify. It's going to build the individual up. It's going to bring encouragement to the individual. You don't correct individuals in the congregation. You bring correction individually to that person. I've seen some strange things in my in my uh, time of going to church, particularly in my younger days. I won't tend to hook up with a church that is immature in their operation of the of the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit in their church services. I mentioned last week, I've been in church services where there's been messages given in tongue, where there should be some interpretation. And Scripture addresses it here, that if there be no interpreter in the service, and you yourself can interpret what you speak, you need to hold your peace because the responsibility by God, the head of the church, Jesus Christ, is that it's you then that becomes responsible to give that interpretation. But I've been in church services where there was people who spoke out in the service out loud to the whole congregation in, a, in tongues, and no, no interpretation came forth. 
That's an error. That's one thing that Paul was addressing here in this 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. This is why the all gifted, those who were all learned about these things, and and uh, unsaved people that might come into the the church service will will think you're mad, will think you're crazy, will think, hey, these people don't have it together. There are a few bricks short of a load. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 21. This is just referencing uh, what's being said here in 14. It, it's, it's just another reference in Scripture where, where people had no understanding. But Mark chapter 3, verse 21 This is about Jesus. Now, he's at this point earlier in the chapter as we're reading up to this, uh, he, he, he's uh, ordaining 12 disciples to go out and minister. And uh, it doesn't seem to matter where he's going he draws crowds because people want to be healed. People want 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 uh, people who are or demon possessed that might be friends or relatives of theirs to be delivered. Uh, they they want to see great miracles take place, and they have need maybe for a miracle to take place in their life. And so they're constantly pressing in around Jesus wherever he goes. I mean, hey, if he uh if he manages to get away for a little little time, they they find him uh, very shortly thereafter and 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 they're once again all gathered around him. So it's got to the place now where where hey he and his disciples are finding it even hard to find time to eat, to have a meal. This is what, what's being done here. As, as we're, I'm just giving you some uh, background moving up to this 21st verse. And when his own people, otherwise friends, this is in his home town, locality, friends or relatives, kindred, heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he has lost his senses. That's what the uh, New American Standard Version, which I'm ministering out of says in the in the king james it says that he is mad he's mad otherwise hey he's lost he's lost his ability to be rational at this point and that was just because hey he, he was kept so busy with people wanting to be healed and and wanting to see see people delivered of demons that they knew and 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 uh, see miracles taking place. Now listen here, in verse twenty-two, following up after that, it says, "And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub, otherwise by the devil, Lord of the flies." And he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Now, Jesus, here in the next verse, 23, tries to bring some reason and rhyme to them on this. And he called to them, and he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? 
And if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. Now listen, he's addressing them on this issue because the scribes and the Pharisees that came down from Jerusalem was accusing him of. He's bringing rhyme and reason back to this. <laughs> He says, think about what you're saying. Satan ain't going to cast demons out of people. Because he is the Lord over the demons. And, you know, hey, a house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan is, is going against himself and those that he motivates to do his work for him, Satan's finished. I just wanted to reference that to show, show, show what uh, Scripture is trying to say here concerning uh, these unbelievers or people that aren't, aren't taught uh, properly in, in, in uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and speaking in tongues. I mean, hey, some people will tell you, hey, they're as bad as the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the and the scribes that came down from Jerusalem. They'll say, hey, that's of the devil. That's the way they've been taught. And that all goes back into three weeks ago and, and the, I guess four weeks now, I've been speaking on the things of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I took you right to Scripture where it's for all who have been called by the Lord our God. Amen. It's for all believers. But yet there needs to be order in your church services. If anyone, verse 27, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three at the most three. And each in turn, and let one interpret. When they're speaking in tongues in the church service, there must be one interpret. There must be an interpretation. So if that's going on in your church where somebody is audibly out loud so that the whole congregation can hear speaking in an unknown tongue and there's no interpretation, that church needs to be corrected. Or if not, the church, the pastor of that church needs to privately address that individual and speak to them of the error and what Bible says about speaking in tongues in a public service. If there's not another in the service to bring the interpretation, if it's of God, then it's your responsibility to interpret it. And the interpretation better not be contrary to the words of Scripture itself. Amen.
But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. I, then I tell you, I've already spoken in tongues in church service quietly to myself. as the Spirit of God gave me the utterance within myself to speak those, but it wasn't for the congregation. It was for me. Verse 29, And let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. Have you ever been in a church service? Now, this is speaking to people that's probably somewhat learned on these matters. And they said, well, I just couldn't help myself. The Spirit of God did that. Well, listen. You have control whether you yield to the things of the Spirit or whether you don't and when it's proper to do it and when it's not proper to do it in a public service. I know somebody that tells me that they can't preach without screaming and hollering all the time and, and, and running around and, and, and jumping up on, on seats and everything else. Well, that's just the way the anointing hits me. Well, you know, I hold some of that to question. I mean, if that's the only way you ever do it, I hold that to question. I can get a little bit rowdy sometimes myself, but I'm not rowdy all the time. I'm a little bit reserved here tonight. We're closing in on closing time here, and I've only gotten down to uh, 29. But if a revelation, verse 30, is made to another who is seated, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, otherwise being it done in order, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted, and the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace." of order, as in all churches, the churches of the saints. Let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but let them subject themselves just as the law also says. Now, this is cultural. Back in that period of time, this is cultural. How many people know that women hold a low position still in many, many uh, places throughout the Middle East? Look at your Islamic nations. This was cultural that Paul's addressing here. And if they desire to learn anything, 
Let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in the church. Obviously, sometimes they were, if they had a question, they just shouted it out, and sometimes they were asking somebody other than their husband. According to what's being written there, what's written here in the, this verse, Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandments. Or the Lord's commandments. But, if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but let all things be done properly and in a orderly manner. Now, I more or less went through these verses and spoke and, and, and gave a little bit of, of, of instructions concerning what's being said with the verses. But the end result is, is that Paul says, hey, but let all things be done properly and in a orderly manner. How about you people who attend Pentecostal-type churches? People who attend churches where the congregations embrace speaking in tongues, prophesying, and exercising other manifestations and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul's saying that at the end of this chapter, you need to make sure that things are done properly and in a orderly fashion. Thanks for being with me tonight. We're done. I've spoke mostly to the church tonight. Periodically, I brought in things as far as Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior. And once you embrace him as your Lord and Savior, allowing him to live his life in and through you, yielding to his lordship, and understanding that it's in him, your position in him, that you boast it's Jesus Christ in you and not anything that you can boast of yourself. I referenced those things periodically in the opening comments of my, my message tonight. But God bless you. Hey, listen, I'm looking forward to seeing you all. If God's willing, next week I'll go to the book of Romans chapter 12 and uh, we'll, we'll discuss the different gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit and and of what what their purpose is in the church god bless have a great week we'll see you next friday amen